This is tape six on February 8th, 1998, with Mr. Jacob Ehrlich. Mr. Ehrlich, you said your uncle in Sao Paulo? Yes. Uh, it was very exciting, a very tempting invitation, where my uncle suggested maybe you would come and visit me in Sao Paulo. It was, since, uh, due to our financial situation, we were never, uh, didn't travel anywhere. I don't really remember my parents being able to take us on any vacation in the past nine, in the nine and a half years we were there. We just couldn't. The situation became so difficult that um, the money, the valuation of the currency and so forth, we could hardly, uh, you, you would reach the end of the month because usually people get paid there by, by month, monthly. And uh, there was hardly any money left for food. It was so difficult. Um, whatever I could do, whatever I could help my parents with, whether it came from music or whether it came from, from my trade and so forth, I would do so. But the uh, situation is such that I decided to go to Brazil to see if maybe my luck would change, maybe I could do better. So I um, traveled by ship in about two and a half days from Buenos Aires to uh, Santos, which is the port and from there went to Sao Paulo and there I um, uh, stayed with my uncle and then I started to um, to look for work as a tourist you couldn't really work I what was your uncle's name my uncle's name was uh, Cabillo Cabillo uh, funny thing I forgot his first name Cabillo Anyway, I, um, um, my, uh, my uncle had to go on a trip, so consequently my stay there in his house was shortened, and now I was faced again uh, with the problem where to stay. I uh, found some friends, my family's friends, that were also in Sao Paulo, and they gave me lodging. And uh, then I went and I looked for... Uh, I looked for something to do. By some strange miracle, uh, one of our Yugoslavian friends knew someone in um, uh, the government, who in turn knew someone in the radio station, who in turn gave me an audition. Uh, I did get in one of the top station, Radio Gazeta, in Sao Paulo which was also published in newspaper publishers like the New York Times here. Uh, I was very happy to inform my parents that they could listen to me on the radio <laughs> from Buenos Aires on my debut, which was uh, uh, something I could, uh, I just, I, I flipped <laughs> when I signed that contract. Uh, accompanied by a symphonic orchestra and choir, it was beyond my belief didn't make much money, but the satisfaction of succeeding in something that I sort of wanted so much was overwhelming. Um, in order to subsidize that, I uh, also uh, worked as a crooner, as a, I had a solo act in a, a nightclub. Well, I was accompanied by a small group singing um, well, in different languages, but mostly in popular music, jazz and uh, some uh, popular songs, melodic stuff like Bing Crosby. I must tell you uh, something. How does one learn how to sing? Well, I think it's, I compare myself maybe. <laughs> they ask the question, do the birds know how to sing when they're born? They don't. They listen and imitate their parents. <laughs> My teacher was Bing Crosby. I must say that proudly. In Argentina, they all all the entertainment that I had was a little radio, which I would listen at night, listen to at night, at 10 o'clock in the evening, from 10 to 10.30, the program Bing Crosby was on. I learned every possible song that he was singing. And that was my, he was my teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, listen to Sinatra, and that was my style. Sinatra, Bing Crosby, Dean Martin, and so forth. Uh, when I came to Brazil, I started singing 
this type of music and it pleased the lightning. I uh, stayed in uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, I stayed for about uh, nine months and I got a little homesick and I wanted to visit my parents which I did. <clears throat> um, on the return trip to Buenos Aires uh, I also play a little guitar and during those during the trip I got my guitar out and I was strumming uh, singing a song and uh, three Brazilian girls approached me and they started singing along who was to know that one of them would be my wife small <laughs> small world uh, one of those strange things when something tell you this is for you Norma my wife stayed in Buenos Aires for one week we would see each other every day uh, showed her the city brought her over with her friends to my house met my parents and we promised we would write to each other every day she left and I received a letter every day until I said to my parents I think this is the girl for me I have to go back and I went back to Sao Paulo and I got another contract until the letter from my dad telling me that the so long awaited visa for the United States was granted it was joy to me again Brazil all South America I think you have to be very famous in order to to make some money and make, make a good living. Um, we always wanted to come to the States. I always wanted to be with our people and uh, change my name, <laughs> get back my name. We did that. Um, when you say our people, what are you referring to? Jewish people. We were did not, we, we, we didn't have, we, in, 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 um, in Buenos Aires, we we the only we only knew one family lived next to us. Though the rest was, uh, all, you know, uh, different religions. Uh, most of them Catholic, which really treated us beautifully, and we had no not one instance of anti-Semitism. I did um, must tell you something. While in Argentina, this I must I must come to that. Uh, while in Argentina. Uh, because I was singing in different clubs and so forth, we happened to sing in this German club. We happened to play in this German club. I was singing and I met everybody was speaking German. They were all uh, people who immigrated from Germany and frankly speaking, <laughs> there must have been a lot of Nazis there. I didn't know. I didn't know and I befriended this German girl lovely family who treated me very nicely when I used to go to the house they invited me once to a party it's a big party and they hired a there was a Hawaiian orchestra that they hired you know and I sang for them I can't I, I, I can't I still can't believe this you know but who would ever know uh, this was a group of middle-aged and elderly people that I remember sitting at that table. And I just wonder how many, how many of them were murderers, how many of them were, were commanders in the army and, and, and what, what bad and what crimes they did. But in a way, I felt like I was in a, in a snake's pit. You know, I'm singing singing for our enemies there. That was the group of people I didn't want to associate with, but the music took me there. The fact that I knew this German girl, they were youngsters. She didn't do any crime. She was my age. You see, I learned German, practicing German, 
And um, that's one incident I just wanted to bring back of, of what happened in Argentina and how they had their own groups. Um, they were really, uh, uh, they got away from, they got away with murder by them being shielded by a government like that, Argentina, and the fact of communism. They got away from that, saying, if you, play, if you said that you were anti-communist, right away. And how many people came here to the States? They were also, which I blame this country as well, very much so, to have allowed criminals, including, they found a lot of them, Yugoslavian, Croatian, criminals hiding here but they survived they I survived our family didn't survive I'd like to ask you when did you become aware of the fate of the rest of your family Argentina was not a country that that wanted it to be known when I most became aware of it was here in the States. Yes. Remember, Argentina was protecting, they were protecting these people. You couldn't hear anything like that. You didn't read anything like that. They were shielding the Nazis, there's no doubt about it. That was truly a haven for, for criminals. And uh, in a way, you know, it's a country that gave me, uh, that gave me um, their um, a place where to stay that gave me, gave me the opportunity to, to become something um, I have nothing against the people I do have something against the government at that time strangely Peron did not bother the Jews Peron uh, must have had some interest he sympathized with the uh, with the movement with the Nazi movement I guess to allow so many people to, and they're still there. So uh, I was aware of it more here than anywhere else. This is a country that, uh, through democracy, and uh, I wish I had come here before. I find that 10 years that I have spent in Argentina was 10 years wasted in my life. When did you arrive in the United States? Uh, I arrived in the United States in 1958, March, um, no, excuse me, um, sep uh, September, um, excuse me, I arrived in this country on, on March 5th, 1958, yes. I landed in Miami, Miami took a bus, two and a half days local bus we didn't know <laughs> given the opportunity to, to, to see United States <laughs> I came with my sister because my parents couldn't we didn't have the money for the uh, for the tickets for the fare so I thought by coming here with my sister I could get a job right away and then send the money to them how did we get to the United States it was by some miracle we knew of a philanthropist, God bless him. His name is Joseph Mazer. Mazer. He was the president of the Hudson Pope and Paper Company at uh, Madison Avenue. I was told by one of my um, one of my father's friends that writing to him might help us to come here because you need a sponsor to come to the United States. As I knew English, I wrote him a nice letter explaining our situation and so forth. He, I got a call from the consulate that Mr. Mazer had put a bond of $1 million for us. When would I like to travel? Um, and the hope was down that everything is, that, that I'm doomed to stay in Argentina forever. <laughs> Can you imagine what joy it was to learn that? Consequently, um, 
when we arrived here in New York, my sister and I were the first. The next day was the first day, I, the first, the first place we wanted to see. Give our thanks to this gentleman. He received us in his office, and um, I took a present, whatever I could afford. It's a, a wood carved gaucho means it's a gaucho is a symbol of of kindness in Argentina. You know, it's a cowboy really. You know. I gave this to him. He didn't ask me where am I going to stay, where I am, or anything else. In other words, saying, it, it, you know, he did his duty, you see. And out of pride, I didn't want to ask him for any money. I didn't have any. I had $50. Remember, the trip was in dollars. And to pay for two tickets, all our savings, all our family savings went for those two tickets. That was the only way out. Um... Stayed in a motel, hotel, and I went for help. So my sister and I went. But they told us an agency, Jewish, uh, an agency on Park Row, downtown. We got there, and uh, there was a lady took care of us, and uh, totally ignored our plight for help. Totally ignored. I became very irritated, and I really wanted to hit her with something. My sister's legs were swollen, two and a half days in a sitting position from the bus, and we didn't have any money to pay the rent, so why are we going to sleep on the street? That aroused a terrible uh, feeling towards our organizations. There was no money to help young Jewish immigrants. Maybe we, maybe, maybe, we, maybe we didn't pursue it long enough, but I got the impression that, that the Jews here had turned their back to us. I never went back. I never went to a newspaper to, 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 you know, to make them aware that here are young Jewish immigrants who went through so much and can't get help from our strong organization here. I never went back. I got a job two days later. Uh, so did my sister. And we saved um, some money to send to my parents who came in three months later. My parents arrived with my little brother. Again, where are we going to stay? Again, history repeats itself. I go to work. I couldn't finish my school. I had to go and earn the money. Um, my sister went to work. My mother went to work. My dad. My mother worked only part time because she'd take care of the, of the young, my, my brother. And uh, I remember living in, uh, we got an apartment in Forest Hills. Uh, 63rd Drive, and um, it was very difficult life for us. I got a job as an optician. Never pursued any my my musical career any longer, because I knew that was uh, that was it would take time, and I need needed money right away, and I needed it. And then again, I was thinking that I left a girl behind, that I wanted to get married. And I started saving, saving, and saving. During all this stay here, not once did I want to spend any money for a phone call to say hello to my, <laughs> to my girl. I don't remember going to a movie. I don't remember going vacation, going doing nothing for 14 months in order to save a dollar, in order to have that money for the trip. 14 months later, Traveled to Sao Paulo, and um, I married Norma. The civil ceremony, and with the blessing of her parents, she was their only daughter. They were in tears. Their daughter going away for far away, 
and when they're going to see her again. Uh, Norma didn't speak any English. Norma um, was a very she's a highly intelligent, highly educated person. Uh, she got a job in a bank because of her French, she knew French, in the, called in a Belgian-American bank at that time, which is which is European uh, American Bank today. And um, she did very well um, until um, uh, we wanted to have a family. And uh, for the first five years, we couldn't think of it because we just wanted to have some some money so that we can we could do something, be buy something, have a have a uh, uh, have a place to stay of our own, you know. And, uh, later on, when we wanted children, we couldn't have them, and that was a terrible blow to me uh, and to her, of course. And we and we tried almost everything. Even once we went on vacation, and. Um, we went to Spain. We went to a, we were in Seville. And let me tell you something. During lunch, well, they tell, used to tell her that the person, a woman, has to be relaxed and so forth, you know. And uh, during lunch, we would drink a bottle of red wine and a bottle of white wine, <laughs> and we were walking like half drunk, <laughs> sightseeing, <laughs> everything for the sake of having <laughs> a family. Of a family, that was our that was our goal. We were having a good time, sure, but we were in a in Seville visiting a castle, and I like taking pictures, <laughs> and I see this elderly gentleman has a yellow flower. He's picked the yellow flower, and is pinning it on on my wife's lapel, and I hear him saying. Eso es para usted, señora, que le traiga buena suerte. It means in Spanish, this is for you. Uh, I hope this brings you good luck. I didn't give it much importance. That same night, we went to a gypsy's cave where they danced and so forth. A uh, tourist place. And it was kind of dark and dusty floor, you know. And it's beautiful, beautiful. Eight or nine year old girl, she's dancing and, and she happened to take, I think I took a look at her, black hair and beautiful eyes. And I told myself, gee, I'd like to have a girl like that. I wish this came true. Later on we found that my wife was pregnant and uh, it was a baby girl. <laughs> I'd like to ask you, yes. uh, well, how many children do you have? And tell me their names. I was expecting you to ask. Yes. <laughs> we didn't have to go back <laughs> to Spain. My son was born two years later. What is your daughter's name first? Uh, uh, Paula. Paula. And when was she born? Well, she was born in 19... She was born April 9, 1971. And your son? And my son, Philip, uh, was born um, June 29, 1973. Uh, it was like a blessing. I, I was happy with one, but when the second one came, it was joy. A true sense of family, and um, I tell you, I, I feel for the people who cannot have children. I was one of the, we were one of the fortunate ones. So maybe whoever listens to this, uh, to this, whoever listens to this, sees this tape, and if they have any problem, maybe my recommendation would be, couple of bottles of wine and go to Seville. <laughs> Get a yellow flower and go see the gypsies. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask you how your experiences during the Holocaust have affected the way you've brought up your children. Um, when Schindler's List movie was made, I wanted my children to see it. My daughter kind of suspected that it's going to be something very, very sad. She was afraid to see it. My son saw it. 
uh, many a times. Uh, my my daughter is, is a person that she she she's very sentimental and she doesn't want to hear sad things. As much I would like him to be better persons and know what suffering is. The reason I am making this, uh, I I agreed to to give this statement of my life's my daughter was telling my life story is. Uh, that certainly makes sure that my children are going to have this state and they're going to see what what we went through in a way what many of the Jewish family went through I'm just a, I'm just one of them it's my story other people's stories are even worse I'm sure my had a happy ending other people did not have happy ending did so my, my my son my my son is uh, very much aware of what I went through, and they they really feel that you know my 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 daughter tells me maybe you know you should retire soon and enjoy life you went through so much as a youngster. Yeah. Did you tell your children what happened to you as they were growing up? Yes, yes, yes. They know the story. And uh, when that article was published in the in the newspaper a year ago. What article are you referring to? Uh, there was uh, the NASA, uh, the NASA Herald. Actually, excuse me, it's the uh, the South Shore Record. The South Shore Record uh, was a uh, paper that uh, gave me the opportunity to tell my life uh, story. Uh, when I was approached by a, a reporter who would ask. Uh, Every week he would ask a different question, you know, and he uh, happened to approach me once. I was in a convenience store. He, actually, that was the second. That was the second time he approached me. The first one was about um, uh, which was the most exciting day, day of your life. And when somebody asks you that, you come and think, you know. And then I told him about uh, the story about my, my daughter, the first child. And here the question was, what was the scariest time of your life? So I said, that I have a lot. I have a lot of scary moments in my life. Would you tell me about it? And I started telling you about it. So he says, this sounds like Schindler's List. You know, this sounds like a very interesting story. Could I do a story on you? Without thinking much, he said, yeah. So. I went to his office and I spent like three hours telling him he wrote a story in this and uh, uh, the paper actually circulates in the South, South Shore here on Long Island and a lot of my clients uh, who never were aware where I was from and what happened to me you know came and called me and uh, you know uh, have a store of opti optical store in, in Woodmere New York and, and people were amazed what a person can go through. It gave me certain satisfaction of making other people aware not to take life for granted. Things happen. Yeah. Um, having read the article, um, I just would like you to recapture one moment that I think we forgot to mention on this tape, um, where you were taken to a Roman cave. Um, we're going to take a break now, but could you tell me about that then? Sure. 